going to uh, take uh, up the discussion where it was left last night with the, the last question, which was a big one. And I think all of us, after that extraordinary performance by Leila Mohammed, <laughs> Someone said, and can you please talk about the role of theater in the Arab world? We all just went <laughs> please. Uh, so, so we did not do that. So we're going to do that now. Uh, and, um, and so we have a fantastic panel with experience from many different Arab countries as well as from Iran. Uh, and as well as from the experience of bringing theater from the Middle East and larger Muslim world region to the United States. So we're going to have a rich discussion and we're very fortunate to have two uh, wonderful policy commentators. You will recognize Nadia Owadad, who was our fabulous translator last night. No offense to me. Oh, dang, you did good <laughs> 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 writing on a little-known subject of moderate Islamic thought. And as soon as she finishes that, which will be very soon, she's going to launch something. Oh, can I say it? Sure, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> and nobody, if anybody steals this idea, to personally kill me and send her brothers after me, so don't. Um, and it's going to change the world, and she's going to launch a website which will publish online for free. Uh, novels in Arabic and moderate thought and writings from the early 20th century in Arabic that will be as accessible online as are all the jihadist texts as another alternative. And last but not absolutely least, we are very fortunate to have Hala Esfandiari, who runs the Middle East program at the Woodrow Wilson Center and is a well-known scholar, particularly of Iran, but runs a wonderful program there. And of course, I'm sure many of you heard about and perhaps read her book about her incredible ordeal in um, being in prison a number of years ago. And we're very happy to have you here and not there. Um, I'm going to begin, and again, we are so fortunate to have Professor Mar Marvin Carlson here, who many of you know as the Dean of uh, Theater in the Arabic world. So I'm going to begin, Marvin, with you to ask you to give a few general remarks on your thoughts. Obviously, you can't talk about the role of theater in the Arab world. It's too broad. So some thoughts and believing that we get at the general through the specific uh, maybe some, a, a couple of specific, or one particular specific example to give us a sense. And remembering that we're looking at the intersection of theater and politics, and I think this is now going to be an area where we're going to see a slight difference between what theater is in the United States compared to the role theater plays in the Arab and larger Muslim world. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Cynthia. Uh, let me, uh, let me begin, since we're starting the second day of the conference now, uh, to, uh, by expressing for, I'm sure, everybody uh, our very deep gratitude to Cynthia and Derek for, for organizing this. I, I, I personally have never been to a gathering quite like this before, and it's astonishing that it's taken us so long to realize this is the kind of thing we ought to be doing, and I hope we'll be doing a lot more of it. Uh, uh, as Cynthia says, uh, to talk about uh, theater in the Arab world is, is a project that can last many, many hours, uh, and, and I'm going to indeed uh, follow what, uh, what she suggested and talk about really a specific example but I think you will see why, of all the thousands of examples, I picked this one. And I think you can also, and I will try to point out why it, or what questions this raises that can stimulate further discussion this morning and later. Um, the, of course, uh, uh, I will only say before beginning a specific example that, as I'm sure everybody in the room is well aware, 
when you speak of the Arab world, you're speaking of a very large number of countries, a very large number of, 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 of cultures, and often, indeed usually, within individual countries within the Arab world, a very great variety of cultures and cultural backgrounds. So, uh, all of which have various kinds of theater and performance that one could talk about, and almost none of which do we in the United States know anything about. That's the challenge and, and the challenge and the opportunity. And the subtext of all of this is try to find out more about this and try to connect more with that theater. Now, I'm going to be talking, uh, uh, first of all, very quickly, I'm going to talk uh, two or three minutes about uh, something lo local, and then for another two or three minutes about the same phenomenon on a global level. Uh, for local, I'm looping back now to the very beginning of this conference, which I think very auspiciously started out uh, with, uh, uh, with Cynthia remarking on uh, the, the influence of Arabesque at, in Alexandria, the knowledge of that, that project and the, the, the work of this. And then the very first, uh, the very first speaker was, you'll remember, um, Alicia Adams from the Kennedy Center talking about uh, briefly about the about arabesque, and so it seems to me, in terms of local, nothing, no place could be better to start than with that festival. Uh, and I want to talk about one particular production in that festival. There were two productions from the Arab world. I'm only going to talk about one of them, and that's the Tunisian play Khamsoun by Jalila Bakar. Uh, first of all, let me let me mark. Uh, that you may not realize how daring and how significant that production was. To the best of my knowledge, and I would challenge anybody to disagree with me, this was the first time, not likely, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to take them on. Uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time in the history of the United States theater that any production of any play from the entire Arab world was given in a professional theater anywhere in America. Now think about that. There are thousands and thousands of such plays. This was the first one. And think what an enormous step that was, what an enormous credit it is to the Kennedy Center for doing Thank this. Thank you, Alicia. I feel like Alicia, take Alicia, it take it The, the, uh, now, Alicia, forgive me, now I'm going to make some complaints. Uh, <laughs> that, that's the good, that's the good. Uh, 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 I have to say that uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in great sympathy, and I imagine Alicia is too, with, with Peter Mark's very uh, informed comments about a number of the problems that face this kind of production. And uh, I made a trip down from New York to see this production on one of the two nights it was given. Now that's, as Peter pointed out, that's not much. It's better, it's a lot better than nothing. But it still isn't, isn't a very big exposure. And another thing that, that Peter pointed out that resonated very strongly with me is that uh, uh, the major point, surely, as this conference, I think, is, is designed to illustrate, is that it isn't simply a matter of doing more plays from the Arab world. It is using that process to better inform the American public uh, and policymakers of who these people are, what is going on in these other cultures, what are they thinking about, what are their concerns. What, 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 what challenges are, are there for them and for us? Um, in that case, this seemed to be... Can I interrupt you just yes. one very quick thing? Just because I'm just reminded of one of the times when I was at the Arabesque Festival and President Obama came into the Kennedy Center. It was actually a celebration, I believe, for Senator uh, Ted Kennedy. I just was struck. There was this whole thing. President Obama came in the motorcade and everything. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of Arab women outside the Kennedy Center. And they started ululating because they recognized that it was President Obama. And I just thought, how crazy is this? <laughs> that he is actually coming 
going to the Kennedy Center while this festival is taking place. But did, Michelle came to some things. Yes. Is that correct? But, you know, could have come an hour earlier, maybe? <laughs> they're wouldn't, kind of disconnected. Wouldn't that have been nice? Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, that, that, it, it, that, that's really, that, that's really is the point, that it, the, the opportunity, the door cracked open a little bit, but not very much. Uh, and and uh, uh, again, just following the play out for a moment, and then I'm uh, locally, and then I want to think about globally. Locally, what if we had, what if really, as a culture, we had paid more attention to this play? Uh, I, I don't know if any of you, aside from Alicia, knows this play, uh, but uh, let me just very quickly tell you that. The play was commissioned by the Tunisian government as the centerpiece to be performed at the National Theater for the 50th anniversary of Tunisian independence. The play was written, was submitted, and was banned. The government did, did not allow this play to be presented. Uh, now, there's a variety of reasons, some religious, some, but mostly political. Uh, now, in the play, uh, the motivating incident of the play is that the, the, uh, the really the heroine, uh, the, 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 the mother of a young woman is really the center of the play, and Julia Bacar played that role. But the daughter is sort of the pivotal character. And the daughter's best friend, the daughter is a school teacher, the daughter's best friend, a young man, uh, blows himself up as a suicide bomber. He doesn't tell anybody else. He blows himself up in the courtyard of the school. And the play then is about the, the, the desperation on the part of both religious and civic authorities to try to keep this under control so everything doesn't erupt. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Less than two years after this, you may remember, uh, a, a vegetable salesman set fire to himself in Tunisia and started the Arab Spring. That is, this play is a picture of a country on the brink of an eruption that could be set off exactly by this kind of incident. Did anybody notice that later? I don't think so. Uh, who knows this play? Who remembers it? Uh, and yet, there it is. There is, there is a clear indication of, let's look at what is concerned, especially because it was bad. Uh, okay. Uh, can I, can yes, I stop you one know. second then? Um, I'll just make a very small pitch and then I want to ask you a question. Actually, Nadia Owadad there and I wrote an article for CNN during the Egyptian Revolution, the day before Mubarak stepped down, which was called um, why Washington was blindsided by the Egyptian Revolution. And we talk about, unfortunately not this play, I'm embarrassed that we didn't talk about that, but we talk about the Yacoubian building, the Egyptian novel, and say if policymakers had paid attention to what was coming out in the cultural sphere and not what government officials are saying, they would have recognized that it was a pressure cooker and the question would be, exactly. why didn't this happen sooner? Rather exactly. than why did this exactly. happen? But I'm curious, was was this play ever performed anywhere else? Was this then the first oh. time it was performed? You, we'll, we make a great team, Cynthia. Uh, <laughs> she we're going on the road. She said, we're going on the road. Uh, she set up the next part of my, my commentary, which is the global. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, I, might, I might say, at, at the time, because I was very interested in, in, in this play, I translated another of Bakar's plays, so I, she's an artist I'm very interested in. Um, and, and so I was watching this very carefully and, and reading the Washington news and reviews of the play, and nowhere was there really any commentary about this aspect of the play. It talked about the lighting and the dancing and so on and so on. Uh, and even stranger, it seemed to me, was I never found any reference to the fact that the play had been commissioned by the Tunisian government and banned, which seems to me an interesting and worthwhile <laughs> uh, Now, now we go to, to Cynthia's question, which is exactly where I want to go next, which is global. Uh, what the, the
the something else, another point that I want to make is not only as a culture are we tremendously misinformed uh, uh, or uninformed about the theater of the Arab world, as a theatrical culture, we are tremendously underinformed about the theater of anywhere in the world, except except the British Isles. We do pretty well with the British Isles, but even countries as close to us as France and Germany, uh, as a theatrical culture, we know almost nothing about what's going on there. And uh, and Bakar is another good example. That is to say, when when the play was banned in Tunisia, where then was it presented? Well, in fact, it received its world premiere at the Odeon Theatre in Paris. Now, those of you who know Paris, the Odeon is the second national theater. It's the other Comédie Française. The Comédie Française traditionally does French work, although it now does international work. And the Odeon, in, in recent years, traditionally does international work. So this is the biggest, most important theater in Paris that premiered this play. Did anybody in Washington notice this? No, not to my knowledge. Uh, especially since the French picked it up when the Tunisians had banned it. Now, since that time, Bacar, well, Bacar was already well known in France, that is to say, uh, several of her plays have been presented in major theaters. She's three times appeared at the Avignon Festival, including the last two years. Uh, do any of us know anything about that? No, no. Why, why should we care? It's in France. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, now you might say, uh, it, oh, well, the French. Uh, <laughs> 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 This is Tunisia. It's a former French colony. Uh, the French have a kind of paternal avuncular interest in North Africa, so they can do it. But why should we be interested? Well, let me go on then and talk about the Germans. Now, the Germans have got no business. They never had any business in North Africa. They were there, but they didn't have any business. Uh, and yet, uh, Jalila Bakar has also been produced in many of the major theaters in Germany. Uh, half a dozen of her plays. The year 2003, the Berlin Festwoche took as its leading artist Bakar and Jalabi, her, her director. They presented two of her previous works and commissioned her to write a new play, which was premiered in Berlin, and they also did three of her plays. This is in 2003. At that time, nobody in Washington even knew who Julia Bakar was. That's the difference between Germany and, and, and the United States in terms of Arab theater and Arab drama. Of course, when, uh, when Hamsun came out, it was also done in Berlin. Uh, you might say, who's paying for all this? Well, of course, it's, the, it, it's at the National Theater in, in Paris, so you have a good deal of state money. In Berlin, it's also essentially state money because it's, it's, it is in theaters, big theaters like the Deutsches and the Schaubühne. And she came really in under the Berlin uh, Festwoche, which is an annual international uh, uh, producing organization. Uh, now, only one other quick point, and that is, I did say we are at least fairly well aware of what's going on in England. Unlike our almost total lack of knowledge of what's going on anywhere else. But even at that, I would say, uh, the British are light years ahead of us in, in terms of Arabic theater. Uh, we had already the, the, uh, uh, the Sharon's report on, on the British Council that has been admirable in this. Uh, there is, as we speak, a major international Shakespeare festival going on in London, which includes plays from the Arab world. Uh, before that, the Royal Shakespeare did a similar international festival, which included plays from the Arab world. 
the Royal Court Theatre. Briefly, theater. briefly interrupt yes. there because Waleed has a student acting in, isn't that? Yeah, in Romeo and Juliet in Baghdad. In Baghdad, which is part of the festival yes, going on right yes, now. Yes, right in now. fact, it's this week. It's uh, this week, yeah. This week, this week, as we speak. Uh, <laughs> And, of course, the, uh, the Royal Court has been an exemplary model of this, which has set up two different seasons with work, encouraging work from playwrights from six different Arab countries. Um, again, there's nothing like this yet in the United States, although, thank God, there is more than there used to be, as, as my fellow panelists will testify. But I only, the main point is, I want to say, not only do we have a long way to go, but we don't have to make it up. Other people are doing it. Just look at what the British, the French, the Germans are doing, and just become, even if we're not becoming more aware of Egypt and Tunisia, at least become more aware of Paris and Berlin. Thank you so much, Martin. That is a great... Uh, way to get us started. I, before I turn to you, Willie, talking about what theater is actually like in uh, Baghdad and in um, Iraq, let me just turn to uh, Nadia for a minute and ask you to respond to what Marvin has said, maybe drawing in also other art forms such as literature and see if you found something similar. Nadia also was an analyst in Iran, so she's lived in the policy world as well. Uh, first, I want to say that when you spoke about the contradiction in the uh, Tunisian government's action banning the uh, play after they commissioned it, actually, if you look at the scene of, of uh, literature and arts in the Arab world, it's full of contradictions. No, we can't hear. Love. So, <laughs> so, to give an example, uh, while the Yacoubian building was allowed to represent Egypt in various film festivals, the writer of the novel was not even allowed to come to the theater when the movie premiered. They, they literally, the security forces, prevented him from attending the movie as if he was a thug. So they wanted to humiliate him, even though he won Egypt all these awards. So they, because basically they, they turned down the novel three times, which uh, it's available in English, by the way, and I highly recommend it. It's one, uh, one of any that is actually translated. But uh, he bypassed um, the censorship by uh, publishing it basically a few pages at a time. <laughs> but they <clears throat> attempted to ban it three times. But also, uh, you know, we have so many uh, novels that are the equivalent of Animal Farm, but. Speaking of Animal Farm, to tell you how absurd the censorship in the Arab world is, that book was banned in Kuwait because it has a pig on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> they did not even read it, because most of the time those who decide to ban something, it is, they either just, you know, aesthetically they don't like it, or there's something that they haven't read it at all, or it's, it's totally shallow, it's people usually who are, you know, clerics or who know nothing about literature. So it's quite sad, actually. So most of these novels written by authors from all over the Arab world, tackling issues, I mean, just name it, the environment, the educational system, democracy, women's rights, every single one of these issues have found a, a beautiful way to express the frustration in novels, mostly published in uh, Lebanon, where there's more freedom of uh, publications, in London, in Paris, and in Germany. So the Arab world is yet to have access, actually, <coughs> sorry, to most of its most brilliant minds. And those that make it through extremes are bestsellers. Mm -hmm. The bestsellers are not the religious texts. They are these novels that expose all. They basically hold a mirror and reflect to us, without any euphemism, what's happening. So we can no longer pretend it is not happening. But at the same time, I really feel so proud of what's coming out of the Arab world. And uh, one initiative that actually put uh, that genre on, uh, on the map is the uh, international, the Booker Prize for the Arab novel. And this is the first ever, it's absurd it's taken so long, uh, the, but the first initiative internationally to recognize these novels. And truly, they're, they belong to humanity. They do not belong to the Arab world because these issues are human issues. And I can't wait for this to be translated. Thank you so much. Um, that's a wonderful thing, idea that the Arab world has yet to have access.
access to its most brilliant uh, minds. Yes, yes, everybody jump in. Feel free to jump in. That is that Bloomsbury Press and the Cutter Foundation have a project together where they are, Anna Sweet has been involved with this to translate um, work by Arab authors into English so that so as to increase that, that access. You know, That's been going on for a couple, maybe two or three years now. It depends on what they're translating. Are they translating government puppets' works? No, no, absolutely. Or are no, they translating? No, 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 no. Okay. So I, I'm not actually. I should look into it. Do a, a great yeah. effort. We need. We need a massive translation yeah. uh, effort. No, that, there are a number of translation efforts, and that's the, the best uh, <laughs> one by far. Yeah. So, so have the have are the plays, for example, that were at the Royal Court, or when you presented your team, were they in translation, or were they in in, in Arabic? Um, it, so the plays, when they're presented in oh, England, are they yeah, presented in Arabic? Yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a complicated process, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk very quickly, very, very briefly. Uh, the, the, the royal court uh, had two, I think two, maybe three, workshops in the Arab world. They, went, they were in Damascus, they were in Cairo, I think they're maybe in a third place. And they, they, what's that? Geneva. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they, uh, they, through through their through their connections in these places, they found uh, a number of promising young playwrights who began to develop plays in these workshops, and then they they picked six of them from six different countries or five different countries, brought them to the royal court where they worked for about six months and developed the plays in, in English. And then the plays were given readings. They weren't given fully staged productions. Uh, uh, subsequently, they came to New York and, and also were given readings there. Uh, uh, some of these plays have since been fully staged. They're all short plays. And, and uh, 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 two or three of these young playwrights are now are now doing uh, careers. Lila Solomon, the uh, the uh, Egyptian representative, uh, uh, just ha is is has a play opening in in Belgium later this month, and is working on a production in Berlin. So th there is th they're working in English. So th I mean that project was in English. I'm going to just keep moving so we get to hear yes. from everyone. But that, by the way, sounds to me like an absolutely model. Um, cultural engagement methodology of you know, going to the place, finding people, bringing back the training, creating the works, and going out with them, as opposed to just sort of parachuting in and out. Um, I actually, I think what would make sense now, Taraj, is to turn to you and Hala, and since we're talking about uh, kind of censorship and political topic in topics in theaters, maybe you could talk a little bit on those subjects in Iran, and then we'll go to the individual countries? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for organizing this. It's, uh, I'm with Golden Thread Productions. We've been producing plays by and about the Middle East in San Francisco since 1996. Uh, it was before 9-11, before Middle East was sexy. Uh, and uh, it was mainly really for us a way to survive because there were, we were two or three uh, playwrights, directors, uh, from the Middle East who were working in the U.S. and we were trying to create a home for ourselves to uh, build an audience and to create a basically a production company that could, in an informed way, um, produce this work uh, that is very much about uh, our experience of immigration, displacement, revolution, etc. If you wouldn't mind talking at this point about you when know, you were yeah. in Iran. Yeah, yeah. so in, in uh, 2010, uh, I had an opportunity to take a sabbatical from this uh, exciting work at Golden Thread Productions and I uh, go to Iran. My thinking was, uh, as you may remember, in 2009 there was the uh, election and all the demonstrations and uh, I imagined the atmosphere would be quiet, uh, possibly hopeless in Iran. I wasn't really expecting a lot of cultural activity um, uh, because everything uh, the cultural work in Iran is centrally funded, central, centrally um, approved. It has to go through a government approval process. So I wasn't really expecting much. 
um, given everything that had happened the year before. Um, so I was planning on a quiet six months to focus on my writing. Well, nothing could be thrown further away from the truth because I, when I made it to Tehran, um, within a week, uh, obviously I have many friends uh, in Iran who are doing theater, I was invited to uh, a couple of plays and the plays were overwhelmingly political, uh, all about the elections, all about what had happened, whether they were adaptations of uh, other um, non-Iranian work or original writing. The political content of the work just blew me away. And uh, you seeing them, where, where were they being done? They were being done in the city theater, in the main theater of Tehran. So they were public, so they were known to the government. It, this is not underground music. This is not, uh, you know, this is public. This is youth, you know, younger people, older people. Uh, audience is mixed. I mean, it was very different from what I expected, and, and it really took me by surprise. So I spent the next few months just trying to meet the, uh, some of the artists and talking to them one-on-one -on -one and learning about um, what... What are they thinking and how do they get around um, this process, the censorship process? Because it's interesting because there are uh, all these different gateways of, of censorship. So from the moment that you think about a project, you have to get that idea approved. Well, maybe not that. Okay, so from the time that you write, you write a play, you have to submit it to the uh, Office of Dramatic uh, Arts for approval to get funding for production and uh, rehearsal space and um, resources, basically. Uh, that process could take months. Uh, it could take years, or you could never, or it could possibly not be approved at all. Um, but for many, um, they do get approved. They are given a, a fabulous budget for production. They are given a venue to rehearse and uh, and perform. And they also take away, their, they take their box office revenue. So uh, it can be, um, you know, a, a, a nice job, basically, for many who work in the theater office in, in Tehran. They um, they have a salary and they have uh, their production. But what, I'm sorry, I would kind of like to get to the political content. Why why are these things allowed? They censor movies all the time. All movies, people are in jail. But why are they allowing? These so movies? as Nadia said, that it's it's a contradiction. It's a society that lives in contradiction. They're, it's not black and white, it's not logical. Uh, one of my favorite uh, censorship stories is that um, one playwright uh, who had permission, who produced this play, uh, let's say in 2005, then wanted permission to uh, publish it. So they um, refused um, permission for publication, saying they had a problem with one particular word let's say the word apple in the play. So what the playwright did was that he replaced the word apple with number 325. And just all, whenever the word apple appeared in, in the play text, he put, it, he put the number 325. It made no sense. It was clear that it was a direct replacement. He submitted it for approval and it was approved that it was published that way. And it has since been produced that way. So, is it logical? No. I actually have a clip. Can I show a clip of a, of a yeah. play? I want to turn to if, um, this is a, while you're getting it set up, the Oedipus clip. This is um, a university professor who's working in community centers in southern Tehran, uh, which is the... If, can you run it without sound while I'm talking? Um, it's happening in a community center in what used to be the main slaughterhouse of Tehran that has since been turned in the 90s, it was turned into a cultural and sports uh, facility. Um, he works um, with uh, the, uh, basically the residents, the school residents of the neighborhood and his college students. This particular production is a very free adaptation of Oedipus, and you may be interested in this, Professor Carlson, because you put together that whole book of collection of plays, oh, adaptations yes, of Oedipus, yes. and this is another one. Do you, and, do you, have, a, do you have this text? I'd like I, I can ask for it, yeah, sure. Um, and it's a very free adaptation. It begins, as you can see, in the hallway, the performance begins. Uh, the audience is standing there. 
um, and the actors begin the, the performance in the hallway, and then you'll see that the audience gets ushered into this huge open room that they're using in a very free, um, free format. The audience is on risers that are movable, and the scenes take place in different parts of the room. Um, as, um, at, uh, and the audience is moved in those scenes. But the content of this, so if we could have the sound, it's basically uh, about class and being stuck in your fate. <laughs>
does the United States have a role in this? Can, could we play a positive role? Are we playing a, play a positive role, or is there no way to do that? And how aware, sorry, how aware are U.S. policymakers of the uh, kind of engine of ideas that culture is in Iran? Um, take you back to three. A little louder, I think. Okay. Uh, usually they tell me I should know you. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. um, if I take you back to pre-revolutionary Iran, um, there was an American cultural center in Tehran called the Iran America Society. And a lot of modern plays, especially by American playwrights, were produced by Iranian groups. So this was one aspect of the role that the U.S. was playing in pre-revolutionary Iran. And since Iran is among those handful of countries that does not adhere to copyright, so therefore, you, as a translator, you are free to translate you know, any play you want. And I'm not focusing just on plays and not on novels or anything. And therefore, you can produce it. In the early days after the revolution, when the government was very busy with um, executions, purges, um, and uh, putting together a new state, the artists, for a brief moment, had a free hand in putting together whatever plays they wanted, as long as, as Torang said, it didn't discuss religion, the prophet, that, and basically Islam. But that was a brief period. Once the regime settled and they found out that there is this activity going on in a number of theaters, the most important one, the city theater. So they, I think, started focusing on the theater and providing some loose guidelines on censorship. But again, as Torang said, the censorship is very bizarre because you take the script to the Ministry of Cultural Guidance. And again, they, they might, if you know people there, they will go through it within a couple of months. If you don't know people there, it might take even a year. And they call in the author and say, you have to change either this whole section or you have to change this word or delete a section of your script. So you think you are done. Oh no. When you do what they want you to do and you start rehearsing, in recent years, a censor shows up during the rehearsal and tells you what you can have or what you cannot have. So this is the second stage of censorship. Finally, it comes to the production. Within the production might last, you know, a couple of weeks on stage, couple of months, depending on how successful it is. But still, the censor has the right to come in and either stop the play or ask for more changes. So you never know from the first day that you produce a play until it is over what is going to happen. And of course, it's very difficult for the actors to stick to the script. They improvise. And if you just so happen that you improvise while the censor is there, you are getting into trouble. But nevertheless, having said that, again because of what Torang said, they don't pay much importance to plays because the audience 
is relatively small and limited. And Iranian theater has not gained the fame of Iranian cinema. The Iranian cinema is their biggest problem, the success of the Iranian cinema abroad, because they are, the government is in a dilemma. There you have a movie like Separation, which wins the Oscar and other you know, <coughs> awards. But then what are you going to do with it in Iran? I mean, you know, you cannot ignore it. And, but you cannot also approve of it 100%. Because for them, any movie, any piece of art, any play that gets an award abroad is part of a soft revolution that the United States and the West is planning against Iran to overthrow the regime. So they are, they are really torn. On the one hand, there, is, there are these young Iranians who get international fame, and then there, are, there is the policy, the fear and phobia of the regime. And a couple of years ago, they started sending out, you know, their own uh, troops abroad, thinking that this is one way of reaching out through cultural, this is their way of cultural diplomacy. For example, the Tehran Symphony Orchestra was sent to Geneva and Brussels, but their performance, the piece of music they performed was so terrible that they, people used to walk out of this <laughs> performance. So, but again, there is a woman director who puts <coughs> together plays on, based on stories of the Book of Kings in Iran. Her name is Paris Saberi. She has been, in a way, lucky because she has been allowed to take her troop to Italy for performances, and uh, she even won a prize there. So because she deals with ancient Iranian history, past history, so stories that are approved by the regime and it is at a very high caliber, high quote-unquote within the context of Iran. So she has had the possibility and has had the funding to take it through abroad. But I believe some of you know that in 2011 there was a festival of Iranian theater at Briggs, mm -hmm. you know, in, in uh, New York. And it was very successful. Some of the, and I, I, when I was reading about it, I was moved by one uh, sentence by an Iranian uh, uh, playwright. Uh, his name is Nassim Soleiman Pour, and who said, and I'm quoting him, for someone like me, this is more than exciting. It's about me writing something down here and an actor in New York doing it. It's like, oh my God, this is connecting us all together. It's a very different experience and I like it. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Well, that, that, uh, there's so many interesting things there also what I think we're observing with our uh, Iraqi friends, which I'm, I'm going to turn to you now, Lily, just you know, you're performing this play here. Um, one of the things we talked about is what will it be like then when you go back to Baghdad and talk about performing it here. And it is one very basic thing is simply being noticed, you know, that people in the United States had some experience of what real life in Iran is like through these uh, through these plays, what real life 
in uh, Baghdad and Iraq is like through this uh, performance rather than simply through the media about the bombings and you know nuclear weapons and nothing about human beings. But I want to turn now to uh, you, Willie. Thank you very much for that very rich uh, discussion. But I want to turn now to um, you, Willie. Thank you very much for that very really rich uh, discussion and talk now more specifically, and we'll do that with uh, the rest of this great panel. Tell us a little bit about theater in Baghdad and don't um, sugarcoat it. <laughs> well, to talk about theater in Baghdad, uh, just simply we don't have uh, theater buildings. We have only two theater buildings. Department of Theater at the University and the National Theater. And that's all. The rest of the theaters are humiliated or changed to be uh, stores uh, or uh, simply uh, not existing. Or bombed. And uh, bombed, of course. And uh, no, the government don't care about rebuilding it. Uh, maybe they are busy uh, doing it. Priorities. However, uh, within that limitation, uh, uh, we have theater people, we have playwrights, we have actors, we have directors, but we don't have theater in a broader sense. And uh, uh, from that, uh, it seems like uh, theater instinct is working very, very, and it is uh, uh, the uh, theater is a, a project of individual, not a systematic. If you look at it, it's here and there, and the students sometimes do theater in the parking lot, like what Haitan did uh, <coughs> in the parking lot and did a play, talking about democracy. And uh, the other student did a wonderful job in uh, a ruin, a, 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 a building, uh, a suicide bomb in that building. And after two weeks, he came with an idea to make and to, uh, to, to, to make this event, and he put uh, a play on that on that broad, uh, destroyed building and make a sense of a community and run for two weeks. Uh, or I just want to make sure everyone understands this because it is so moving to me the idea of going to a site where a building has been bombed and going to that very place and starting a performance there that draws in the community and starts to rebuild the community and create a sense yeah. of community and possibility again. Uh, but also in a church. In, in, uh, and also two years ago, uh, a suicide bomb in a church, and uh, uh, the church called the Saint of Lazan, Ladies of Salvation, and one of the students also uh, did a play inside that and gathered all the people who was in, 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 in real estate. But these are individual, it's not systematic, it's not uh, supported by, it's just uh, an initiative of uh, 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 people. Uh, if we go back to previous regime and Saddam regime, uh, the theater was just for entertainment, it's censorship. You can't talk about Politics or religious or sex, and these three—it's forbidden. Common theme, common theme. So do whatever you like, but these three are in can touch. <laughs> so the theater we call it commercial theater, which is low theater. Okay, you can do whatever you can, but don't touch these three. Now, this time uh, you can talk about everything, but nobody listens to you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very, very limited, uh, limited audience. But individuals doing work like what uh, you have seen last night, uh, some other works. We uh, do things. We, we do plays. We uh, challenge. Uh, we, we we go through many themes, and uh, uh, but very limited as. Uh, uh, Talan said, it's a very limited audience, and it lasts for two or three days, and uh, only friends and intellectuals and uh, uh, theater people, uh, and not for broad... Theater, in fact, is not the core of the, of the culture uh, enough. And also because of the security situation. I mean, 
security situation not allowed uh, to go and uh, have an uh, evening uh, with your family. It's, uh, but now it's improving, I guess. And um, in the last three years, life is going back to normal. But what is normal in Iraq? Just you, if you go to the, to the news, you see bomb and you see uh, destruction. However, um, what I want to say is theater uh, 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 is in the theater people, and in, in the blood of the theater people. But unfortunately, we are uh, waiting for have a place to do, I mean, buildings to do theater. And uh, this is a normal. Thank you. Let me just make, thank you so much, Willie. It's very, very beautiful. I say for uh, English not being your first language, I think you may have a future as a poet in English. <laughs> um, I just want to point out something that has come out here as a theme that I've noticed a lot, and that is that the enemies of freedom and tolerance and openness and human rights and democracy and all of these things always recognize the power of culture. And so they censor it. They take down the buildings. They bomb the Buddhists in Bamiya. Uh, but ironically, the supporters of all of those values in the United States, but other countries also, don't seem to recognize in the same way the value of culture and support it. So, for example, as we have discussed, Wally, there is one theater in Baghdad, and there is no movie theater. No movie theater. Seven million, sorry, seven million people live in Baghdad and the second largest city in the Middle East after Cairo and no movie theater in Iraq. Can you imagine? Just one movie theater and a VIP club. So just think of the, you know, the work of rebuilding a country and really totally reinventing it for people and a completely, you know, we expect them to suddenly, you know, catch democracy from the air and put it on and go. Um, and no movie theater. Think of the amount of money the United States has spent in Iran. How is that possible? And, and, and you know, talk about public diplomacy. What kind of movies are they going to show? Well, of course they're going to show American movies. Uh, you know, I mean, others too, I'm sure, but largely they're going to be American movies. So I, the thinking it really boggles the mind. Or not thinking. Um, Ruben, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, which is going to be a dramatic contrast, and that dramatic contrast may be something that we talk about. Yes. <laughs> um, Ruben is doing incredible things in Abu Dhabi, uh, where he is doing theater at NYU there, which is there, you know, there are many universities, American universities in the Middle East, including Georgetown has a, a very impressive branch of the School of Foreign Service in Doha, but I have to say that what NYU is doing in Abu Dhabi, I think, is really head and shoulders above anything else I've seen, anyway. And witness the fact that they have such a vigorous theater program. So I would love for you to talk a little bit, I'm going to ask you don't talk so much about your company, because I really want to get to what you are doing in Abu Dhabi to cross what I thought were all kinds of red lines in society in Abu Dhabi and in the Emirates and bringing people together and broaching subjects because they got plenty of censorship there too um, that aren't always broached. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think the, the, the framing that started this conversation, which is the idea of um, there being so many narratives and so many different conversations of predicaments throughout the Middle East or Africa, the Lebanon, it's all, all these are incredibly different uh, challenges, I feel. Uh, that in hearing uh, uh, some of the narratives about Baghdad, there's a, a bit of overlay, but a whole other conversation, as you were saying. Um, I, I'm a artist director of Theater Meek, which is my company, as you mentioned. And, and, uh, is everyone hearing everyone hear? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So louder. I'll be louder. Louder and slower, maybe. Great. Not too slow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I'm artistic director of Theater Meek, um, my company, and the core of our work has been uh, to investigate uh, global traditions in theater, uh, to, to create a training uh, and a methodology that then we manifest in our work. About five years ago, I was approached uh, to head the theater program for a new venture 
uh, for New York University, which is part of the, the global network, is what it's called. And the idea was a university in Abu Dhabi, which is a four-year liberal arts university. Uh, and uh, and uh, not only by nature of where it is, by nature of the research uh, that I've been doing in the region, uh, but simply the, 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 the largest challenge of all, which is actually to uh, enter and begin a conversation uh, about theater and a theatrical ecosystem in a place that actually uh, doesn't really have one. Uh, and, and that uh, when I first entered the conversation, I, I thought, well, of course it does. It certainly does. Now, there is performance, and there are touring uh, uh, entities that come in. In fact, the piece that we're seeing tonight, uh, uh, 1927, uh, arrived into Dubai, uh, and well, only recently. Uh, and uh, so there certainly is that. But, but an actual ecosystem in the region, in, in the Emirates, uh, it doesn't exist. And, and, and that's been shocking, actually. Um, again, there is performance. There's there's a large, uh, an extended tradition of songs, of ritual, uh, and of uh, a Western theater that, that, that arrives and leaves one night, two night. Um, so the challenge seems beautiful and overwhelming. Uh, I have a couple of quick slides uh, that I think will give great context. Uh, if you go to the next one, um, I think people forget that Abu Dhabi is incredibly young. This is a picture of Abu Dhabi in the, in the 1960s. So this is what it looked like. And, and, and what's essential to me is actually that the, the place is actually uh, younger than I am. <laughs> so if you if you go, this is what Abu Dhabi looks like now, right? And so I, I say that because with all its shortcomings, and, and trust me, there are many, which I'm happy to speak at length about, uh, uh, yeah, politically, socially, at every level, uh, there is a nascent to it, right? The culture, the the the, the, the Emirati people uh, in the UAE. Uh, are divided into these three layers, right? One is what's called the desert generation, which are the people who actually lived in the desert, and all of a sudden, in 1971, their life changed completely. Completely. And I mean, images of them truly, truly in the desert in tents. There's, then there's what's called the middle generation, which are the people whose life, uh, they were children, and then everything changed, but they essentially uh, have a little bit of a, of a bound memory of both. And then there's what's now called the new generation, which are most of, most of who have grown in this moment in time, and actually have no memory of the other. And so you're seeing these different questions and different relationships to art and to theater. And so we've arrived uh, as NYU Abu Dhabi and really are the first of, um, a, a, of a group of uh, artists, liberals, academics that are arriving, at least in Abu Dhabi and in that region. For me, in the theater program with, with my company, one of the challenges was producing the, the theater. So uh, as always, we, I, I point over here to my associate producer, Tyler, that has been with me on this journey. Uh, and, and it was about what does one produce there? Right? Uh, uh, I made a commitment with my company that we would continue producing the work that we do, certainly reacting to what we are, uh, but not necessarily saying, well, now we'll do a thousand and one Arabian nights, or we're going to pull, you know, to, to not simplify the conversation. Martin was very kind when we started to, uh, he was remembering some productions of my company that he's seen, and, and that's exactly the work that we said we were going to take. Um, the first piece that we did uh, is, is uh, uh, if you go to the next slide, is, uh, is a piece called Chaos. Um, and one of the big things that I wanted to address uh, was actually to, to try to diversify the audience conversation, right? There's a way that, that the strata of audience in Abu Dhabi is humongous, right? According to formal documents, 80% of the population, or between 70 and 80, are expatriates, right? That's shocking. I mean, that, that, so when you walk around and you see the world, it actually often feels like you're not at all in the Middle East, and certainly not the Gulf, right? 10% is what's called the worker population, which are immigrant workers coming from South, Southeast Asia, uh, from Nepal, from uh, Pakistan, from Afghanistan, right? And then a smaller, about 10%, is the Emirati population, right? That's incredibly it, it, it confusing when you are there, right? Uh, now, that said, there is a huge population that's undocumented that changes all those numbers, and the belief is that there's probably more to 30 to 40% of the population that are illegal workers that are coming in from all over the, the, both the region and extends as far as, uh, as Morocco, right, that are coming in that are not documented. So for me and for my company, it became important to not necessarily change what we do, but actually change the dramaturgy of space, of how people encounter the work, right, of, of the, the threshold between audience and performer. The first piece we did, we did uh, on the Corniche, which is perhaps the most important part of Abu Dhabi, because I wanted people to run into the work. Right? In the place that you want to go to the theater, people aren't going to show up at 8 at this place. And so we built this, this stage that actually went into the ocean. And if you go to the, the next, uh, and I'll jump into the, the next one, um, and you'll see a, a little bit, it'll, it'll run uh, by itself, I think. Uh, if you go to the, the little video, and I'll stop it. Uh, this is the formation, that's the scenery that we built. Um, 
and the, the performance itself was uh, uh, based on a series of, of uh, Pirandello short stories and, uh, and plays that spoke about uh, the questions of migration and workers and how does hope survive, how does tradition survive. And, and in, in doing that, we were able to really engage uh, every level of, of, of audience uh, that, that at least uh, uh, we are starting to discover. Um, if we go, I'm trying to go through these quickly, so I'm so sorry. Um, the, the next piece that we did was we did a, a if you go to the can next. Can you turn the lights please. down a little bit, please? Dim them. Thank you. Actually, you can leave it on for, uh, leave the, the video on for a moment. Um, one of the things that was, that was interesting about the, the work with chaos um, was actually the producing of the piece, right? Which is that, that there are also, like in fact, that there are no theaters, right? But there's also nothing with which to physically make theaters. Now, that sounds peculiar in a place that's opulent that there's, you know, gold walls and gold hotels and all these things. But as theater makers, you realize that our, our art form is not something uh, that is supposed to be so distant and worshipped, but rather engaging. And so truly, getting chairs like this, impossible. Impossible. <laughs> I can get those big Yes, these huge things. throws, yeah. they want to give us, and literally, the argument was, I want people to feel like <laughs> it's such a, it's such a uh, it sounds like, oh, what a silly complaint, but to realize that the, the, the communitas of the theater is actually uh, really complicated to achieve in a place that doesn't have that, right? Uh, and uh, if you go on to the next uh, uh, slide, please. Um, the, the next piece we brought was a really radical adaptation of Death of a Salesman that we had done, uh, where it was done with four actors and uh, a series of 15 uh, Raku style puppeteer objects from the 1950s. And it was really about looking at the worker conversation. For this one, I actually wanted to reach the expatriate community, which I think often is ignored. There's a way that, that people arrive in Abu Dhabi and engage in tokenism of saying, well, I get some Arabs in my theater. I, I, that counts, right? But that population is, in a large, in a large percentage, is this expatriate population. And the hope is actually to engage with them in a conversation as well, right? And in fact, have that be a key thing. And the, the last thing I want to mention, I think if you go to the next, uh, that's death of a salesman, if you go to the next slide, um, was uh, uh, to begin to actually push the agenda of other views in the conversation. And so we were able to do this, uh, again, a, a very physical adaptation of the Ramayana, this, this ancient uh, Vedic poem. Right. Something that was really key to us was could we take a piece and have it to deal directly with the different strand of audiences. So the one manifestation of the piece was actually in this opulent, opulent uh, um, hub of a gallery called a Manara, which is going to become essentially the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi. Right. And the, the, the communication, the marketing, the reach out really was to reach this opulent group of people who come see theater. Then, Later that, that the exact same day, we would do a much more strict down version and begin to take it out into the worker villages, right? Which are these worker camps that exist. Now, a few things that are, that are key that have been shocking to me is the, the production you saw of Chaos, that was the first professional production created and produced in the history of Abu Dhabi, right? Now, that to me is terrific, exciting, but also incredibly uh, dangerous. We are not from Abu Dhabi, right? So what, is, what does that mean? And so, the conversation of navigating those cultural territories continue to be of great interest to me, right? And, and, and what is it that we're developing there? This, if you go into the next... I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, I, just, I have just gotten a complete dead deadline, and I have to make sure that I include oh, of course. JJ and Tracy, so I'm so sorry. I'm, no I'm problem. These are just the images from the work that we did in the, in the workers' uh, villages. Um, and, uh, and it was really incredible to, to, to have to be able to do that. So there's much work to, to be done in navigating that. Uh, but I get very excited about the work well, we're doing. We're going to have <laughs> lots of time to talk at, at lunch, so I know you guys are going to have lots of questions, and I'm not going to let you ask them, and I'm so sorry about that. I really feel terrible. Thank you. People have had such interesting stuff to say, and I do want to turn to Tracy and um, JJ, and I want to let you all know that we're not going to have a break. We're going to go right on to the next panel, so if you're dying, you must... Uh, you, yes, we are sorry. <laughs> Derek looks shocked, but, but that's nonetheless what we're going to do. Uh, so, everyone, uh, get ready, and if you're in a panic, leave. Um, let me just make one um, observation following up on what you said. I just written an article for Georgetown's very impressive Journal of International Affairs, which is put together by our undergraduates, and it's on Abu Dhabi as a cultural hub, and in that article I make the point that if Abu Dhabi really wants to be a global cultural hub, I don't think it can do that without 
being generous with its resources with at least other Arab countries, if not more than that. And I know you are already doing that. I'm not blaming you. I know, I know Ruben, you're already doing that. But the, um, that was, I'm addressing that more to the government in Abu Dhabi, but I think that's the definition. You can't just build up your own place. You have to bring other people in. Um, so JJ and Tracy, I'm sorry, you're going to have to kind of speak in tandem, but, but used to it. I would like you to talk about the incredible work you do in New York using multiple mu multimedia and also the kinds of audiences you draw in. Yeah. Um, so just to give us a little brief introduction, um, I'm Egyptian American Theater Director and Artistic Director of Hybrid Theater Works, and I, which I found it with JJ. Right, and I'm coming out of the Brandeis University uh, acting together on the world stage. That was my undergraduate experience. Um, so we, we met uh, when we were working in the Arab American Comedy Festival together. Which you want to kind of briefly bring into conversation because comedy has yeah. been a huge part of both the Arab American community and now going into the Middle East in terms of breaking down stereotypes, reaching people. I've worked for the Comedy Festival for about eight years now. Um, and you know, now comedy is you know, such a huge part of you know, especially Egyptian culture. That's how people communicate. That's how they express themselves. And there's a lot of touring now of the comedy festival within the Middle East. So I just wanted to kind of just bring no, that is, that everybody the should anyone who speaks Arabic should check out Basim Yusuf, who is their Daily Show equivalent, who's taken off yeah. like wildfire. I'm going to have to let him speak now. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, you know, just to, to tie into what we do, part of um, what Hybrid Theater Works really aims to do is, like the Arab Comedy Festival, create events that are in and of themselves fun, accessible, entertaining, and, not, and breaking the boundaries of traditional theater. Um, so one of the programs that we've started that's been tremendously successful is the Artist Response Forum. Um, this began a few years back, and we, we wanted to pick global issues and topics, and then invite artists to create short-form work, we're talking about 10, 15-minute pieces, in direct response to those global issues as they happen. And the goal of that, of course, is to shorten the time period between the thing that happens and the artistic response, which usually happens like a year or two later, right? So we wanted to sort of condense that experience and bring this up to speed for a 21st century audience that's used to getting everything immediately, quickly, very, you know, click of a button, I want it now. And also to encourage the artists to engage with issues of the world around them rather than create work you know, solely within their experience or personal world. Um, so an example, we work a lot with uh, Middle Eastern artists and Arab American artists and also encouraging U.S. artists to engage with issues in the Middle East. Um, so one of the artist response forums that we did... <laughs> Which you guys are great. <laughs> yes. Um, um, the, uh, the revolution will be live streamed, and this was, I think, the fourth iteration. Of the I think so. Yeah. Um, so this was done at El Juan for the Arts, which is uh, so who's producing a nice play. Yeah. 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 No. Yes. So you say so Monday yeah. night and Monday night, night at El Juan at this place. And what happened to be in New York? Seven p.m. <laughs> Seven p.m. El Juan, New York City. Nine parts of desire, if by any chance you didn't get to see it here. And Alana is a Middle Eastern cultural center in New York that presents work about and by, uh, by Middle Eastern artists. And I have to say, Alana is actually the most formal theater space we've ever presented in. Usually we're on a rooftop, we're in the middle of a street, we're blocking traffic, we're yep. praying to God it doesn't rain. Or get arrested <laughs> or, or for or no permits. Or get arrested, or like um, someone gets hit by we, a car. And to go off of that, I mean, that's part of our purposeful to get a diverse audience, right. to get an audience that's not just people going to the theater, to get people walking that street. What's happening? Why is there a person hanging from a fire escape like our event last week? Um, and just you know, engaging a wider public and a wider community for us. Can um, we go to the next slide? I'm going to have to ask you guys to describe just this. And yes. I'm really we're sorry. Good. We're going to have to really good. All right. So this event, event was, um, was about, we asked artists to respond to the Arab Spring, to the Middle East uprisings. We had uh, Arab American artists. We had artists from Iran, Lebanon, Egypt, uh, Libya, uh, Dubai. Um, and the Middle East artists were actually presenting work either that they had filmed in the Middle East and sent us videos of or... Um, we had visual artists and the slides up, we had poets that sent us things in. And then there were a lot of collaborations that happened. One I have to mention because Nassim Soleimanpour is one of the artistic associates of Hybrid Theatre Works. So when we say we're a producing company in New York, that's true, but we have a collective of artists that we work with all over the world. Nassim and I had a four-hour Skype session, wrote a play, and I was literally holding up my laptop saying, this is Harlem, Nassim. I know you can't come because you can't get a visa. This is what it looks like. That experience was absolutely transformative, and I know Tracy's had 
similar experiences collaborating with artists of the Middle East, and that was one of the pieces that we premiered in this particular show. Um, and so, and also with this event, so since a lot of our artists were in the Middle East, we didn't have funding to bring them all here, but we were representing their work in New York, and we wanted to include them in the event. So for the whole event, we live streamed the entire event online. Wait, sorry, go back with um, and back. We had a, We had a Twitter feed, basically, so the, the international audience could interact with the New York audience while they were watching the show. I know a lot of the international people, you know, they like took naps, so time difference is an issue. So a lot of them like, took naps and they set their alarms to watch it, and we're up for it. Um, and like we had this painting in 12 countries. Yeah, so this painting right here is um, a wonderful artist um, who, she lives in Dubai, and she's like, I really want to present my artwork in New York. Um, and so we presented her paintings, and we, you know, communicated online for the past year, and we finally met her in New York um, a few weeks ago. And it was a great experience to have collaborated with her in this sense, and then finally make the personal connection. Okay. One more minute. One, one. one. Okay. So, so, so go sorry. to the next. This sorry. is just briefly. Last summer we hosted Chucky Bindi, Amir Alasaki, and Wali. <laughs> it was a great reuniting, seeing them again. Um, we can go to the next one. Uh, we did a series of readings of their plays, and we produced a night of theater called uh, Creating Theater Under Violent uh, Rules. Is that what I have Something like that. Uh, it was a great conversation. And I, if I could just hold here for a second, I just want to highlight this. This is one of my favorite moments of their visit because I think that diplomacy, you know, often has this sort of grandeur to it. And, and when you're doing person to person diplomacy, which is what Roberta and I often talk about in the context of Theater Without Borders work. It comes down to moments like this, sharing cheese fries from Shake Shack, which are the greatest thing that New York has to offer. So, you know, this is sort of a, a real moment of, like, cut through all the stuff and just be people, which I think is just really Just to wrap up real quick one final point, because um, a lot of the talk's been happening about work that's about politics or that's political and doing diplomacy in that way and presenting viewpoints. One way that we want to work as a company is not only Creating diplomacy by presenting viewpoints and things like that, but actually creating diplomacy through the collaboration, through having people from different cultures, different countries, different viewpoints, creating work together, and through the process, having diplomacy that way. More process than product. Which is interesting because we heard about that in the case of the opera yesterday, exactly. which is like the diametric opposite of what you're doing. But, you know, it happens in all contexts. So I just want to thank you all so much. I think you gave us such a rich, rich assortment of ideas and inspirations. I hope everyone will seek you out. And we are going to now yield our places to the Africa. So we're actually going to take five.